Hi y'all, I'm going to ruminate a little bit about American uh, liberties and North Korea and see if I can tie those two together. When I have discussions with people about gun rights and why gun rights should not be infringed, one of the uh, lines of argument that I use is comparing it to other rights and, by point and pointing out that they kind of rise and fall together. Whatever it is that you decide today you know, with respect to someone's rights uh, that you don't really care that much about, Whatever you decide uh, that you're entitled to do to their rights today will be done to you by someone else in the future, or you leave yourself vulnerable to it when they agree among themselves that, you know, sure, you cherish your right to free speech or your right to vote, but we think it could be curtailed. And, after all, uh, you saw this other person's rights, you didn't like those rights, and so you took them away. You shouldn't really have any uh, objection to it, not a principled objection to it anyway, because you've already decided that it's perfectly okay to strip people of their liberties if you don't like them enough. And I'll get a response to that, uh, something along the lines of uh, free speech doesn't get people killed, uh, words don't kill people, uh, voting isn't like guns because guns kill people, things like that. And uh, you know, military orders are issued through words, that's just speech, and yet the consequence there is lots of death. Votes uh, elect presidents and uh, congress creatures who decide on when we do and don't engage in military conflict with foreign countries, which I can't help but notice tends to produce some dead bodies. Uh, many more of them have died from guns, by the way, but putting that off on the side. Uh, I'm sorry, by private ownership of guns. And so they will point out that, well, the words don't do the killing. Yeah, well, neither do the guns. You have to have a human intermediary to carry out the whatever it is that produces the effect. With respect to the guns, a human has to operate it. With respect to uh, carrying out the orders, humans have to hear them and understand them and go do things. So there is an intermediary there. The things all by themselves don't produce the calamitous effects that we all don't like. But look at the precarious situation we're in now with a nuclear North Korea. The one option that we have to take is the one that we can't, and the one option that we're going to be stuck with is the one we can't live with. So, you know, namely, the one that we should be taking, which is war, is the one we can't do. And the one we can't live with, just letting them continue to devolve down the spiral of insanity until they really get good with weaponry and we're really screwed, is the option that we're stuck with because they are now a nuclear state. And uh, they are a nuclear state now because of the failure of the United States. In particular, uh, two presidents had an option to stop it, and neither of them did for different reasons. The first one was Clinton, who was smart enough to recognize the threat, but uh, had lacked the spine to take definitive action to stop it. And then you had Bush, who followed him, who had the spine to take action, but not the brains to figure out how to pick targets correctly. That's why we wound up in Iraq, which didn't have weapons of mass destruction, and uh, somehow managed to avoid North Korea, which was really producing weapons of mass destruction, uh, right there. And it wasn't a secret that North Korea was doing this. The reason that there was the, um, the agreed framework of the 90s was because the, the heavy water reactors, everyone knew, weren't, uh, weren't there to produce electricity for North Korean citizens. They weren't hooked up to the electrical grid. I mean, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, you have, to, you have to plug it in for it to work, and they weren't plugging it in. It was to enrich various uh, byproducts to produce nuclear weapons, to ramp up their nuclear weapon uh, program. Uh, so Clinton decided that we'd, we'd talk with them and, and try to normalize relationships and have some step forward to get them off this nuclear thing because reasons. And then Bush gets into office and, uh, you know, you have some guy that tells a lie about uh, Iraq and because they're already predisposed to want to do something with respect to Iraq, uh, really dodgy intelligence suddenly becomes, oh, we've got the silver bullet. You know, that's why Colin Powell goes to the United Nations and embarrasses himself. Uh, the problem there was that the people who made the decisions didn't bother to go look at the intelligence themselves. The guy who was giving them, you know, the shuck and jive about what he had seen, if you had just looked at the imagery that was in possession of U.S. intelligence, it was perfectly clear that what the guy described was impossible. It wasn't just like he got a detail wrong here or there, just what he described in exquisite detail was just impossible, and we had the proof. It was in our happy little hands. But one of the problems is, you know, when intelligence comes from you know the bottom to the top, is that it tends to get better the higher up it goes. Uh, become more confident. See, I'm doing my Clinton thing here. More confident about the conclusions rather than less confident about the conclusions. And unfortunately, the secretaries and the presidents don't call up the people who do the groundwork to say, "Hey, this is the report that I got." Uh, what's the difference between what I'm reading from your superiors and what you wrote? Is there a difference? That's kind of what you want to do. 
Um, but anyway, that didn't seem to happen, and well, we wound up wasting trillions of dollars and untold lives in Iraq, uh, you know, on this uh, wild goose chase. Meanwhile, that money could have been spent dealing with North Korea before it was a nuclear state, thereby putting us in the position now where uh, there is it, it's, it is a real catch-22. Uh, I'm not much of a warmonger, but you can't help but notice that the North Koreans are getting a little great, well, crazy-er. I mean, they've been a little nutty for a while now, but it seems like uh, they're buying into their own propaganda about how great they are, and uh, they are really ramping up their um, attempts at flexing their muscles. And that puts us in a precarious situation. I mean, we have to do our little flybys and send a strike force, a uh, carrier strike group nearby to for a show of force, which everyone on both sides understands is kind of hollow, because North Korea knows that uh, it, it's very unlikely that we're going to hit them first because they have nukes too, and we know they have nukes, and you know, so that's in the calculus, and like I said at the, the beginning, that puts us in the situation where the course of action that would ordinarily be indicated is the one that we can't take, which is to say intervene now to stop it, because they are clearly uh, becoming more and more aggressive. And the option that we're forced to take is one we can't live with because that allows them to continue refining their weapons programs. Namely, uh, the one we can't live with is just sitting around and doing nothing. So something has to be done, which is the precise option that's not available to us because they are now a nuclear state. And then uh, Obama could have done something uh, there instead of you know uh, failing to notice ISIS arising, failing to notice the problems that would be in Libya. I mean, he... he was just as a, rep, as a repetition of like a combination of the failures of the previous two presidents, and uh, so he lacked both the spine and the intellect uh, to deal with the, with the enemies. And then uh, you know you think about that, and then Clinton wanted to be pres uh, wanted to be president, and her thing was not focusing on the North Korea problem, which is the most pressing one if they continue what they're doing now, but going into Syria to set up safe zones by. Uh, you know, uh, imposing no-fly zones cooperatively. You, you don't impose anything cooperatively. A no-fly zone is is, a, is, a, is an act of war. You're saying, I am claiming some kind of ownership over your sovereign territory, and your option, if you disagree, is war. What now? Uh, and you're know, risking that with Syria, which isn't a big problem, but with Russia, which is a big problem, because also nuclear state. It's It's just bizarre. So my concern with Hillary Clinton was the Syria situation in Russia, uh, but any president was going to have to deal with North Korea sooner or later. And I'm glad you know, Mattis is in, in the Defense Department. I hope that works out well for us. But with North Korea, it seems to me that war is unavoidable, but it's the option that we can't possibly take because, I mean, you know, there's a lot to be said about the fact that the nuclear capabilities of North Korea are only so much, but with nuclear weapons, you only have to be so accurate, and they only have to be so powerful, and you can still kill hundreds of thousands of people, even if you're off by a mile or two. I would not want to be living in Seoul. Oh, in Itaewon, uh, pop smoke, get him out, gotta go, chaga. I would be getting out of there so fast if I were living there, unless I were stationed there again, in which case I wouldn't be going anywhere because I'd be working there. And you know, all right, come over, North Korea. I've got my, got my trusty rifle. <laughs> Bring your nukes. I'll shoot it down. Pew, 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 pew. Anyway, it is just, uh, it is a dumpster fire, and I don't see any way forward that does not uh, greatly imperil our national security interests and, you know, the poor South Korean people. Now, when Clinton, I'll finish with this, when Clinton did the, uh, the little deal with North Korea, he gave the speech talking about how if the North Koreans live up to their end of the bargain, this was just nonsense. There was every reason to know that North Korea would not live up to its bargains, particularly because it hadn't abided by the terms of the armistice that we signed with it, uh, you know, in the 50s. Although we haven't exactly been studious about uh, our part in the armistice either, uh, we're not hostile. We're not being aggressive towards North Korea. We're not trying to threaten them with the extermination or anything like that, like they are doing the South Koreans. And, and then, of course, what they call the vassal forces. <laughs> Sorry, I just love vassal forces. I love that expression. Anyway, uh, you know, whereas they are directly saying we want to kill X, Y, Z people in in A, B, C places and mass destruction, leave things in ruin. A lot of it's rhetoric, but you know, they are refining their weapons technology. So, at some point, you've got to you've got to think 
they are getting just crazy enough to do something stupid. And so you have to do it now or do it later. Anyway, Clinton had to have known they weren't going to live up to it. And I think what he was doing was just kicking it down the road to the next president and saying, oh gosh, I hope they come up with something and then I'll be able to say, well, I did my part. Uh, I delayed it and gave them time to really work out a resolution. Unfortunately, uh, the guy who came after him had the spine to go to war, but not the brains to pick a target correctly. So, <laughs> I guess the long and the short of this is, it seems like we're fucked either way. Have a great day.